Dear the distinguished uh, scientists, colleagues and friends, you might ask obviously uh, what Arriva might be talking about thorium, uh, especially when we have uh, forward-looking energy. So I will try to address in the coming 20, 25 minutes, trying to address you what our view is on thorium as part of forward-looking energy. So our elements that we will be addressing are essentially the possibilities, the challenges and the paths forward that we consider. Possibilities. Okay. You might ask yourself obviously, why is thorium today again modern? Okay. For a lot of reasons. When you're, we heard yesterday the different talks by different uh, speakers, but also in previous conferences wherever around the world, well, it's neutronically exciting. I'm trying to summarize quite a lot of papers. The reason is, it's fertile, and you need, you know, a kind of fancy neutron balance in your reactor in order to make use of thorium. As soon as you introduce fertile materials like thorium, you need to balance the neutrons well in whatever kind of nuclear energy system and nuclear reactor. Especially, as mentioned yesterday multiple times, uranium-233 can be the kind of plutonium-239 among the thermal neutron spectrum systems where you have to go with plutonium-239 in fast reactors, while uranium-233 can do the job in thermal energy systems. And it can provide even routes for synergies among thermal neutron spectrum reactors, and it even can provide avenues towards higher conversion ratios in these kinds of thermal neutron energy systems. However, obviously, you have to deal with some protactinium-233, uranium-233 issues in your core management, but these are overall manageable. It can, the second kind of family of, call it claims or messages that are coming out of the different uh, papers, it can in the longer term offer some advantages. Both less minor actinide production, higher melting point and the school of fuel, which can be quite interesting avenue. And, and there's essentially one oxidation state, which is also in the, in the context of fuel cycle interesting. And maybe above all that, it's not plutonium. It's not the devil, okay? It has been advocated already for a long time as surely not plutonium. So it's really, from that perspective, I'm sorry for the wording for the ladies in the room, but it's, you could call it sexy because it's not plutonium, and that's why it's attractive, okay? And it might provide certain degree of avenue to new nuclear, okay? But there is already a kind of renewed or a new hype on thorium today. Generation 4... Most proposals on thorium today only address one family of strategies, being thorium-dedicated nuclear energy systems. I'll come to that in a moment. Many can, and I'm sorry for some, but many can be, according to my terminology, classified as Generation X. It can be Generation 4, but might well be beyond even Generation 4 in certain cases. And especially if you have to take into account the whole fuel cycle developments that go associated with it. On behalf of plutonium minor actinide management, one of the drivers in the surely since the 90s was during the last two decades partitioning and transmutation, where also avenues of thorium use for plutonium management and especially plutonium burning had been advocated. And surely nuclear energy sustainability, look to the example of India, where you're really transitioning in a Gen 3, Gen 2, Gen 3, Gen 3 plus kind of systems towards uranium-233 thorium cycle. Just as an anecdote, even in Europe, and some of the um, colleagues in the room know that much better than I do, but if you're looking to the public reply on the strategic research and innovation agenda of SNETP, about one-third of the reply addressed to some way or another thorium. So it's a hype, okay? It's modern and it's attractive. There are some socio-political consequences from this hype, okay? Sometimes we, as Arriva, get messages in the mailboxes from different countries around the world somehow stating we can accept nuclear energy a solution as long as it's thorium-based. So there is a kind of Increasing debate and to a certain degree flawed dis discussion on the potential of thorium and sometimes even cannibalizing the true scientific and technological meaning of it. And the debate is mostly or mostly even solely driven 
by longer term generation 4 or even generation X kind of systems using thorium. Therefore, we claim that there's kind of scientifically technological correctness required. There will never be a thorium fuel cycle without an initial or for a certain time complementarity with uranium plutonium cycle. Thorium is fertile, so you need fissile, okay, to start with thorium. Secondly, well, that has been said, any thorium fuel cycle requires reprocessing and recycling if you really want to achieve the objectives of the thorium cycle. Also over there, synergies and complementarity of uranium-plutonium cycle will be overly important. And obviously, when you're looking to minor actinides production generation, very low, non-proliferant, and whatever you want, and no natural uranium, yes, you might achieve that, but your transitional period in nuclear energy systems will be long. And you only will achieve the claimed objectives somewhere in the next century, and you will need this century to make the transition happen. Now, let's demystify the role of thorium to a little degree. Okay? There are essentially three major families from our perspective relating to thorium. First of all, a complementarity of thorium with uranium-plutonium systems. And there, you could see different sub-objectives looking to lengthening fuel cycle time in LWRs, looking to reducing natural uranium per terawatt electric, demand, looking to providing multiple recycling options for different uranium-plutonium vectors, replacing sometimes depleted uranium in specific cases, and even breeding to uranium-233 in order to initiate the transition to what comes uh, later on. The second kind of family is or the kind of, like I take the example of India, the AHWR, which is a Gen 3+, plus, Gen 3, Gen 3+, plus, I... I, I uh, apologize if my uh, classification might not be uh, according Indian classification, but there you're talking already about transition towards thorium uranium 233 driven systems with mostly known and or evolutionary evolving nuclear technology. And then the third family where you could call thorium dedicated Gen 4 and sometimes even before beyond Gen 4 systems with generation 4 or X longer term options considering different kinds of uh, variants like we have already heard earlier yesterday and probably today. Now, anyhow, thorium use will demand a long term strategy, both from governments as from industry, if you want to introduce thorium one day. Okay. It's maybe hard wording or blunt wording, but forget the claims from our perspective that you will have whatever kind of sizable use with one exception of India, but sizable use in non-Indian countries before 2030. For a lot of reasons. There are currently no classic arguments in favor of thorium driving before, for instance, natural uranium shortage or whatever kind of objectives of that na uh, nature. For an investor in an NPP, the international market offers solutions. It's flexible, it's competitive, etc. So there's no real classical economical drive towards the thorium nowadays. And thorium fuel development and qualification will take anyhow time and resources. Okay. So it's quite simple. Unless a government is driving really a large thorium fuel and reactor R&D program with a long-term vision, the introduction of thorium from our perspective will happen progressively in Gen 3 or Gen 3 plus reactors, preparing the Gen 4 and the Gen X options later on. We'll be providing answers to specific challenges tomorrow and not tomorrow plus 80 years. And we'll be ensuring that thorium containing fuel is complementary with uranium plutonium fuel cycle and offering additional flexibility to NPPs operators. Now, it might shock you that we are that outspoken and blunt on this, but you will clarify, you will get a clarification very soon. Now, let's take a kind of drawback, uh, not a drawback, a step back, and let's, let's look a little bit macro now. Since the early days of nuclear, we have been using digging uranium, and we have been using uranium in essentially CANDUS and LWRs. As you know, some countries, especially France, and our company especially, we have been embarking into 
Eurex, reprocessing, we recycled uranium, we recycled the plutonium, we put the plutonium into MOX, back into LWRs. We can continue to do so, and we can do a second recycle, okay, in LWRs or what we could call Gen 3 plus kind of LWRs with small evolutionary modifications. One day, obviously, we want fast tractors, being it breeders or fast tractors, for a lot of reasons. Purely physical speaking, because we want to improve and to keep our plutonium isotopic balance correctly and sustainable. Okay? And there we can go, obviously, to fast tractors in breeding mode with multiple recycling of plutonium, or even we can use those fast tractors to have a flow back of good plutonium into the thermal system in order to make it happen. And then, obviously, for the time being, in most cases, even in India for the time being, you have the thorium fuel cycle, which is in parallel, but without really physical and or chemical interactions between the lower part of the curve, the lower part, and the upper part. Okay? Now, as you know, this kind of development, and if you even give a kind of indicative timeline of, for that development, you will see that there are some, obviously, time slots where some things might have to happen or might happen, okay? Now, what are maybe challenges and might be avenues for thorium, okay? As nuclear will grow, there might be some concerns. I think everybody in this room hopes that by 2030 or by 2050, we are not having 440 power plants across the world, but we will have 700, 900, 1500, 2000. My company would like that very much, and I hope you will like it as well. So there are uncertainties on climate change debate, on the role of nuclear energy, on the role of nuclear energy sustainability, etc. Secondly, we and our competitors currently undertake designs of LWRs that will get on the market, let's say, in the 2020-2030 time frame, that will last for 60 plus years. That means we are designing today things, machines, that will still be operating in the next century. That brings, for an investor in nuclear energy, additional questions on flexibility, on security of supply, on security of operation, over the remaining of this century. Okay. So investors need to be assured that fuel availability and especially what we say fuel cycle flexibility is addressed correctly. And that's why to a certain degree we within Arriva we are having views onto LWRs and whatever kind of reactors looking for instance are they able to start with few weeks we transition towards 30% MOX why not 200% MOX like we are proposing in certain countries? And why not one day also having uranium, thorium, plutonium, thorium kind of fuels? Okay? In a kind of interplaceable uh, mode. In addition, new NPPs, especially allowing multiple recycling PU, will need complementary between LWRs and fast reactors, such that we can address it correctly. Now, challenges ahead. I try to give you a kind of, you know, a kind of blunt perspective of from an industry player in this say, and maybe it cools you down for, for, for a few minutes. Okay, we'll try to heat you up again now. So challenges ahead. Obviously, what are the drivers to use thorium in the medium term? And we're not talking about post 2050, post 2080 or whatever, but ideally also at a larger scale in due time. Well, market, new market conditions for thorium compared to the past are, well, obviously nuclear power is hugely capital intensive and resource intensive, so there are obviously certain degrees of lock-in mechanisms. Thorium, uranium-233, involves multiple issues in a 100% thorium U233 fuel cycle. Fissile material balance for startup, it was addressed yesterday. Recycling, especially refabrication issues with uranium-232. Prolifer risk assessment, which is not univocally uh, concluded on that one, and if there wouldn't be a new market conditions, one could easily remain with thorium on paper level, okay? And why not continue like that, okay? So the question is, are there any new drivers for us, for the industry at large, to revisit thorium? And if so, if we revisit thorium, can we deploy them at sufficient large scale, making them economically, technically, economically, to a certain degree, attractive. Well, conditions are 
Are there any improvement avenues in uranium-plutonium cycle where thorium might provide added value? And yes, within our EVE over the past few years, we have done our homework, we have done the assessments, okay? both with consultants, both with other parties, third parties. And we have been looking into lengthening the fuel cycle in LWRs. We have been looking into reducing natural uranium demand. We have been looking into the multiple recycling of plutonium due to the inbreed of uranium-233, of uranium which is improving or burning less plutonium and m providing avenues for a second or even multiple recycling, replacement of burnable poisons in specific cases. But obviously, we have been doing our assessment, not only from the neutronic reactor physics point of view, but from the mine until the waste disposal. And looking to the whole issues of what kind of impacts that might have on the facilities, fuel cycle facilities, etc. Obviously, no surprise, any consideration of thorium use needs to be progressive. And we have been downscaling and down tuning our kind of sets by keep as long as possible the torified, I'm sorry for the wording, but the tori thorium containing part of the fuel cycle as long as much separated from the uranium plutonium one because then you can avoid at least the combined uh, investment in uh, specific uh, facilities. And as mentioned, as long as possible, keep both fuel cycles separated. So without disclosing what kind of concepts we have in mind, but those that, and I think 99.9% .9 of this room understands perfectly, what we mean is that couple uranium-plutonium and the thorium fuel cycle neutronically, but try to avoid to couple them chemically and or physically as long as you can because then you still can use the uranium plutonium fuel cycle facilities, you can still optimize your LWR and or whatever kind of reactor park, while gradually, progressively introducing thorium where it makes sense and without contaminating one cycle in the other or vice versa. So we have concepts on the table in order to use thorium conveniently. An alternative scheme is, I come back to what I sketched before, you know, there are uncertainties, both on fast tractors, both on different kinds. Fast tractors might not make it in the market everywhere in a short time or at a large scale like it was anticipated before, except if it's in specific countries needing tremendous nuclear energy demand. So then, indeed, we are looking into scenarios where you introduce, instead of having thorium, and at a certain moment, like India is proposing, we are looking and we have been assessing and we have concepts of thorium where you, we introduce it already in LWRs for a lot of the objectives that we were mentioned in two, two slides before. Now, all nice wording, and here you see a kind of flurry or summary of kind of different options without disclosing too much what kind of specific designs of fuel assemblies we are having. But the assessment is ongoing, and I would like not to spend uh, to detail uh, that much on that one. Now, some takeaways from our assessments and from our concepts on thorium use. Based on an EPR design, which is, I would say, one of the best tractors you can find on the market today and being built, but with evolutionary fuel options, meaning 17 by 17 and you remove a new wix and you put a tox into it, being it uranium thorium or plutonium thorium. We have an envelope of evolutionary thorium use potential. And one, we can state, yes, one can beneficially introduce thorium in these kind of systems. That's already a strong message. Secondly, all depending on the details of the concept, between 20 to 50% of the energy during the cycle length of that kind of fuel will come from uranium-233. And all depends on the initial investment in fissile material, etc. Most options require reprocessing to achieve the objectives as claimed before from thorium. Given the stable uranium-233, that's a small uh, item, you can, you can accept delayed reprocessing and you can reduce even further. An improved plutonium balance in UX and MOX for multi-recycling of PU and reduction in enrichment needs and even reduction in minor actinides production. So yes, 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 yes. However, the transitional period to get to there will take decades. And you can't get it sooner than that. 
Now, what have we done in Thorium in our company? Well, it was mentioned by Didier Haas already yesterday and by others. We have been already doing quite a lot since the 80s in Germany. We still have the labs, the people, the expertise available. We currently have three kinds of fuel fabrication technologies virtually on the shelf or under reassessment and under reconsideration. So, yes, we are doing and we are capable of doing the work related to thorium. Okay. Now, I would like now to focus on, I think, the most important part okay, for the remaining five minutes. What are the paths forward? And maybe we were a little bit coolish for the first 15 minutes, and I hope you will now appreciate what we are going to say now. Yeah, thorium can have its place in a growing nuclear energy future. And as nuclear energy m will be or is a prime contributor to address climate change and energy sustainability objectives worldwide, yes, a progressive and uranium-plutonium complementarity is what we are looking for and is even conditional from our perspective. Secondly, yes, any introduction of thorium needs to be assessed industrially to ensure technical, economic, effective and efficient introduction. And that's what we are aiming for. Secondly, given the overall worldwide developments related to thorium, both in the nuclear energy field and in the rare earth market, we are proud to announce today that Solvay and Arriva have made an agreement to valorize thorium and to have a joint R&D program working on the whole set of thorium valorization from whatever source until the waste disposal. So we can say it clearly. It's the first time we openly say it. We have an agreement. We will detail now in the remaining three, four minutes what we mean by that. Okay. What are we doing? If you look to the whole set of thorium-related aspects, being it from the rare earth market, being it in nuclear energy, Solvay and Arriva are complementary because we have in France thorium stocks. We have been managing both from Solvay side, us from Arriva side, the fuel, uh, the, the thorium, both separating it, purifying it, interim storing it, and then further on looking to additional uses. And that's why we joined and we, after a long uh, discussion and a long uh, interactions, we uh, recently decided and we have signed the agreement uh, on our collaboration. What are we aiming in that collaboration? Okay. Well, the agreement is in fact since 2013 a collaborative program towards thorium valorization. What means thorium valorization means resolving thorium residues issues arising from certain rare earths mining operations and market conditions in the past and even in the future. Providing an industrially robust valorization argumentation focused on thorium valorization in nuclear power in the medium term and ensuring best practice interim management options for thorium awaiting thorium valorization in the medium term. Okay. An R&D program is focused on thorium valorization in nuclear power with international R&D partners that we are currently detailing and working on towards first phase of fuel development with near radiation by 2020. To give you a flurry, and this is a macro view of the R&D, we have been doing in the past few years a scoping analysis on thorium, on the different options, doing reactor physics studies, doing scenario studies with PhDs, with technical and other kind of international projects involvement, with know-how transfer from our experts from the 80s to our experts today. We have been detailing and fine-tuning, we have been talking and walking with Solvay on the different business approaches and the different R&D facets that we have to address. This has been defined now, will be further detailed in the next few months, in order to, that from early 2014 on, we are really geared into a very detailed and a very focused R&D program, which will lead us to segmented fuel rods, and later on, maybe even, that's a decision to be taken later on, uh, fuel assemblies in LWR, EPR kind of facilities, with later on, obviously, going towards qualified thorium fuel development. In summary, last slide. We would like, please, to demystify thorium because it's too way, too much 
sometimes coupled between thorium with de thorium dedicated long term reactor systems, please, there's also thorium future nearby. And if you don't want to address that nearby medium term, you might not even maybe get the longer term option one day. Okay? So we are taking another stance maybe than uh, some of you. Thorium generation 4 or X systems won't make it without an initial long period of complementarity of uranium plutonium and without sometimes even a government long term vision spurring that development. Is there a clear market for uranium, thorium, plutonium, thorium, thorium fuse in the short term? Not really. In the medium term, however, there is a possibility, depending on a lot of local and or various market conditions that we are currently assessing that we have, and obviously not going to disclose at full. However, transition will take decades. Okay? And that's why both Solvay, us, Arriva, we said, okay, we are going to investigate both the thorium fuel options as a complement to uranium plutonium in an international context to address holistic thorium management from the origin of thorium, wherever the origin is, until the final waste management, etc. And looking to, as well, the valorization, looking into thorium use in nuclear fuel when time comes. And obviously, the last bullet is, if you would like to mo have more information, my colleague Thierry Delois from Solvay is sitting in the room and myself, we are able to provide you additional information. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for a very nice talk and very good timing. Uh, so we do have uh, time for a few questions. Uh, Champier, you would like to start? I've got the microphone. Just I've got the microphone. Where is the microphone? Here. Here. <laughs> Here. Here. <coughs> ah, you have it. Ah, yes. okay. Shall yeah. I ask my question? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Jasper Tomlinson. <coughs> um, uh, uh, blunt um, perspectives. Um, could, you, could you say something about the price of electricity generated from nuclear power in your estimation? i just say a word or two first before you give your answer. Um, in, in 2003, people were saying it would be a penny a kilowatt hour. And then you go to 2004, it's going to be tuppence a kilowatt hour. And today in England, it's negotiated at about something over nine pence per kilowatt hour. Those are English money. But um, and, and that, in a sense, relates to the investment cost uh, in terms of dollars per watt. And, and, and no one's been talking about that so far in this conference. And that, that seems that to me... That was a question yesterday on... Uh, so, so, well, so yeah, the question yeah. is, your blunt perspective on the cost of electricity generated by nuclear power. Two answers to that one. First of all, obviously, I can't disclose very detailed information on CapEx and OPEX of whatever kind of deal or whatever kind of contract we have on specific reactors. The figures you quoted are correctly those that are quoted in the press, okay? M now, my, m it's a kind of rhetoric uh, reply. First of all, I will say on the short term, yes, and it all depends on the kind of market situation where LWR have to be competitive with other kind of energy sources, and that will be in the UK and that will be in other countries. We, don't, we are not concerned about that. If I might ac extrapolate your question towards and have you any slightest idea what the thorium kind of option might be doing a delta cost in, in energy? We have assessments, okay? we have ideas. However, the value of that is not really that relevant today. Because nobody is reasonably able to tell me what might be the cost of energy, and especially the substitutes of nuclear energy, by 2030, 2040. Okay? I think we should make it short. There are 50 seconds left, so Jean-Pierre. Yeah, I, I want to say that it's really uh, great news to see for the first time an official statement from a company like Areva uh, saying that thorium is on the map. And I think I take this as a really excellent, excellent news. But unfortunately, it's immediately moderated by the time scale that uh, you talk about it will take a century and uh, in practice it uh, allows you to continue doing business as usual uh, and uh, 
tell people, look, be happy, we have thorium on the map. Do, do I understand this no, is your strategy? No, no, no. Because no. you're too busy with no. Generation 4, so no. you cannot uh, no. go to, to thorium? No. Make a very short answer. What we said, going towards the fully claimed objectives of thorium in whatever kind of system will take a long, long time. But you have to start maybe now in order to initiate that trend towards ever achieving those objectives.